This morning I'm going to be in Mark chapter number 6. Six, uh, starting in verse number 53. It says, And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Genesaret and drew to the shore. And when they were come out of the ship, straightway they knew him and ran through the whole region round about and began to carry about in beds those that were sick where they heard he was and whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch if it were but the border of his garment and as they touched him were made whole how would we act if Jesus were to show up here in person, to show up in the flesh, you see, he's already here in the spirit. You know, we don't always act like he is, but he's here in the spirit with us. But if he was to show up here in the flesh, would we recognize him? Would we be excited about it? Would we run around and tell everybody? Would we run up and down Wildcat? Would we run up and down Meat Camp? Would we run around and tell everybody, Jesus is here? Would we? Would we bring the sick to him? Would we carry the sick out in the streets? just for a chance that Jesus might walk by them and that they might could touch his garment and be healed, would we do it? Or would we act like we do a lot of times now, like we don't even know who Jesus is, like we don't know what Jesus is capable of doing, what he's able to do? How would we act? Which one of those would we be? Would we be the one who would just be like, oh well, or would we be the one out there trying to get everyone we could to come to, to come see Jesus, to come get their healing? You know, we shouldn't have to see Jesus in the flesh to get excited. Amen. Jesus is with us every day in the spirit. Amen. Jesus is with us right here this morning in the spirit we should be excited about that we should be excited about Jesus all the time you know Jesus is the same now as he was then he can still heal he can still make whole he's still the way but right here's the thing we have easier access to Jesus now than they did back then. Hey, Why do we not take advantage of that's it? Good, John. You know, we don't have to wait for Jesus to walk in those doors. We don't have to wait for Jesus to walk up Wildcat. We have 24-7 access to Jesus no matter what we need no matter where we're at no matter what situation we're in we have 24 7 access to Jesus we're not waiting for him to come to town he's already here why do we act like he's not? Why do we not go to Jesus 
Why do we not reach out to touch his garment every day? It's right there for us. It says that they besought him. They begged him that they may touch just the border of his garment. They, Lord, just let me touch the hem of your garment. I know there's power in it. I know that alone will heal me. That alone will make me whole. See, we have access to that power, to that border of his garment. See, our access is right here on this Amen. altar. Our access is in our prayer closet. Our access is at the foot of the cross. Jesus died on the cross to save our soul, to give us 24-7 access that we didn't have to wait for him to come to town to have that chance to reach out and touch his garment. Amen. He died so we had that access whenever we need it. All we have to do is just reach out. He's there waiting for us to reach out to him. You know, if, it's, if we need it, we can bring it straight to the Lord. And we can know when we bring it to him that he hears us. We have the ability to reach out and touch Jesus any time that we need or want to. We just have to be willing to do it. We have to believe that we can. Believe that Jesus died for us. Believe that he has the power to do it. But most importantly, we just have to be willing to reach out. Amen. That's all he asks, is that we believe on him and that we reach out to him. It's not complicated. There's no special formula, no certain way to go about it. Just believe and reach out and touch him. He wants us to. He don't. He's not going to step back from us. He's going to be right there reaching out for us. Amen. So just no matter what it is in your life that you need, whatever's going on in your life, just know that you can reach out to Jesus. You can reach out and touch that hem of his garment. You can feel that same power of Jesus that they felt over 2,000 years ago, but without having to wait for him to come to town, to walk by where you happen to be at. We have that access whenever and wherever we need it. We just have to take advantage of it and use it. Wonder if anyone might have a word for the Lord this morning. If we just come in here in the flesh, we would start thinking in the flesh. Oh, yeah. First thing we'd start on fleshly things. Then there wouldn't be but one of them. So I don't know if we'd want to go out with a bunch of people. Because we'd rather be good for ourselves. That's, That's why he had to die. That's exactly he right. Every church this morning. And if we did have this altar lined up with prayer tassels, <coughs> Oh, yeah. Would people be willing to come up here and just reach out and touch them? When it's two or three o'clock in the morning and you're feeling all alone, you're feeling like there's nobody there to support you, God is there. Amen. Jesus is there. And He is can come to you and take care of those things in your mind and heart that you need. Amen. Exactly right. No matter how alone we feel, as long as we're saved, we're never alone. Jesus is always right there with us. Just have to turn to him. If no one else has anything, we'll dismiss our classes.
Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Alan, pray for us this morning. Thank you, Father, for this day, for all you've done, all you've given us, Father. I ask you to lead Kevin and guide him, Father. Speak through him. Talk to us, Father, and show us what you would have us learn today and to do for you. In your precious name I pray. Amen. It's amazing how God works with what James opened up with and what he's gave me this morning. We're going to talk this morning about a woman that, that looked Jesus right in the eye and said something to the effect of, where were you when I needed you? And like James said, you know, we have access right now when we ask for it, when we, when we need it, when we want it. But sometimes we feel like we don't, don't we? Sometimes I have to admit that I feel totally alone, even when I know I've got a friend that sticketh closer than a brother <coughs> with me at all times. I, all I have to do is call on him and know he's there and believe. Uh, we've been talking about the I am statements that Jesus made in, in the book of John. And this is going to be the fifth one. We've already went over, I am the bread. And that was after he fed 5,000. We went over, I am the light. And that was after he gave sight to a blind man who got to see light for the first time. We went over, I am the door. And we learned that was talking about to a sheepfold. And I'm sure that in that time, there was a sheepfold somewhere that he could point at and say, I am the door that to that sheepfold and we've already went over I am the good shepherd and I'm sure as he was talking about the sheepfold there was a shepherd there that he could use as an illustration for for what he is to us but on every occasion that he says I am and then he describes to us what he is. When he speaks about life, he's talking about himself. He's the only one that can give life, no matter what kind of life it is. And he's the only one that has power to say, it's time for life to end. Yeah. We have to be able to remember that. There's, there's going to come a time in our lives when our heart is going to stop beating. But that's only going to happen when God says it's time. Right. He speaks life into us. And when it's time, he says, okay, it's time for it to end. That's the way things are. Uh, there's different kinds of life. But when he talks about life, he's talking about something that he and only he fully understands. We don't understand it. If we understood life, we could take a dead body and put life back into it. But it's something that we do not understand. We come, we live roughly 70 years, and we leave. Now, there's different kinds of life. There's the life that I can stand up here and prove to you. I can draw air into my lungs uh, and speak. There's blood pumping through my body. I am alive. There's evidence that I'm alive up here in front of you because I can blink my eyes. I can see you. You can see me. I am alive. When you bring a house plant into your house, that plant is alive. There is life there. But there comes a time when that goes away. And then there's also life, which we've already talked about, called Zoe life. And it means a full, happy, joyous experience while you're here on earth. That is living life to the fullest. That's not living a sad existence that gets you from point A when you're born to point B when you die, and there's never any happiness there. And, and we all know, can name somebody that's lived their life from A to B and never experienced a happy life. And that's sad. That's not what God wants for you to have. He wants you to live in Zoe life, a complete, happy, joyous experience here on earth. Not just in heaven, not just after we leave here, but the best that you can be, the best that you can be for others, the best you can be for him, 
right here on earth. That's what he wants for you. And then there's life that he spoke into existence during creation. And he and only he had the power to do that. The bottom line is, he has the power of life. Whatever kind of life it is you're talking about. If it's alive, it's because of him. He has the power to give it. He has the power to take it away. He is in complete control of life. Your life, my life, anything that's alive. Don't forget that. Today, we're going to talk about the fifth I am statement. And it is, I am the resurrection and, guess what, the life. Now, we are a church that believes in the resurrection, right? Amen. Somebody give me the definition of resurrection or resurrect. To bring up, make alive again. What else? To be brought back. Say it loud. To be brought back. To be brought back. Good. I looked it up. Number one, it's had two definitions. It's to bring back to life. The second one is to bring attention to or to use again. Okay, so we all, most everybody in here remembers the 9-11 attacks, right? But somehow over time, they've sort of been forgot. You never hear anybody talk about that. Except this week, I've heard a few people talk about 9-11. But when we bring it back up and we say, I remember after the 9-11 attacks, people were buying flags, the churches were full, all this stuff happened because of the attacks. We are, bring, we are resurrecting that memory from our minds to use this morning or whenever we choose to use it. We are resurrecting that to put into use. So when we pull that back up, it's a resurrection of that memory Good. brought back to use. The first one was to bring back to life. So we've already said that, that God, Christ, is life. He speaks life. He has the power to give it, the power to take it away. But it's also to bring to attention, to use again. Now you have to remember that as we look at these verses. We've got quite a few of them this morning. That's exactly right. And he's the only one that had the power to do that. But we're going to see that he also had the power when somebody's life was taken away to speak it back into them and have them stand up and walk. Amen. And he's the only one that can do that. A doctor can't do it. You know, in 2005, my dad had a heart attack and his heart stopped. He flatlined when we got him to the emergency room. And they gave him a shot right through his shoulder here, straight into his heart. It's called a clot buster. And they shocked him, and it caused his heart to stop, start beating again. Now, them doctors could take credit. They could say, we started his heart back. We shocked him and started his heart back. But his heart did not start back because they done that to him. That helped. They done their part. But only because God said, I'm going to give him some more years did his start, heart start back beating. He had the power to give that life back to him. Now, the doctors can kind of take credit for that, but I know that God done it. We're in John chapter number 11 this morning. We're going to start at verse number 1. It says, Now in a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son might be glorified thereby. Now what did we say the definition of resurrect is? To bring back to life or to bring attention to or to use again so he's 
we know, we, we already know the story, that he is going to go to where Lazarus is, he's going to bring him back to life, and he's going to use that for his own glory. Right? That is the two definitions that we used. He's going to fulfill both of them right here. He's going to bring him to life, and he's going to use this uh, encounter for, for his own glory. Number five. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still there in the same place. Then that saith he to his disciples, Let us go to Judea again. And his disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and goeth thou thither? Again, and Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light of the world, of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now, what did they just tell him? They just said, Lazarus is bad sick. But then Jesus says to them, he's asleep. He's in his bed. He's resting. That's how they take that. Now, listen to what they say. Then said the disciples, Lord, he sleep. He shall do well. What are they saying? He's resting. We should just not go back there. They want to kill you there. He's asleep, resting. Just let him rest. They don't understand what he's telling them here. Howbeit Jesus spake unto Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And you can almost sense that Jesus went, He's dead. I'm I'm just talking in parables like I always talk in, but you're gonna to have to start understanding what I'm saying. Lazarus is dead, we have to go there. You can almost feel the frustration as you read this. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. To the intent you may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, this is the same Thomas that said, I will not believe that he's came back until I see the scars in his hands and thrust my hand into his side. And he's saying, let us go. We'll die with him. Now, that sounds like he's pretty confident in Jesus, don't it? But somehow he loses that between there and after the crucifixion. Verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. Now I want you all to underline that verse. But I know that even now whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it give it thee. And Jesus say, saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. Underline that. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now I'm going to ask you this question this morning. I want you to look inside, deep inside your heart. And put yourself in this position. Now we know the outcome of this story. But if Jesus looked at you, just like James said, we have full access to Jesus this morning. And he said... Your brother is going to rise again from the dead. He's been dead more than four days. And he says, do you believe this? 
would you believe it? I wouldn't believe it. Now, that's the honest truth about it. I believe that if a man has laid dead for four days, that he's not going to get back up and, and walk around and talk to me anymore. I think that he's dead. Now, you have... Okay, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Verse 27. She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. I love that right there. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she had rose up, hastily went out and followed her, saying, She goeth out to the grave to weep there. Then, okay, I want to tell you something about that right there. there when somebody would die in this time, they believed that the spirit would rise up out of the body and kind of hover around in the room with the body for a few days. And that it might even decide to lay back down in the body and the body come back to life. But after a few days, they had no choice but say, yep, they're gone. So now you know this has been at least four days, and I'd say it's been closer to ten days. Okay, 31 again. The Jews which were with her in the house, now they're waiting to see if the body wakes back up, and comforted her when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth out to the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not have died. Now, that sounds familiar, don't it? When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he, groaning in spirit, was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? And they said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should have not died? Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave, and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Saith I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe that thou should... That, okay. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou would believe thou should see the glory of God. Now, he originally said that all this happened so we could see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead had, was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always, because of the people, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had Thus spoken, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Now, I've told you in the past, I firmly believe, had Jesus not put the name in front of that statement, that every dead body on planet Earth would have stood up and started in his direction. Why? Because he's God, Amen. and he has the power to speak life into the dead. <clears throat> he has the power to lay down his own life. He has power to pick up his own life. And but he is in control of any kind of life we're talking about. Had he not said Lazarus at the first of that statement, dead bodies all over the planet would have started in his direction. Verse 44. And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin, and Jesus saith unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen 
things which Jesus did believed on him. Now, that's what his original goal of going there was. Verse 45, many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed on him. That was his whole point of going there. So people would see that and believe that he was the son of God. Now keep a couple of things in mind here. As we go through this, we know the ending. Don't forget, we already knew the ending before we started reading this. But Mary and Martha didn't know the ending. They did not know what was going to happen. You put your place, put yourself in the place of Mary and Martha, and your brother has just died. Somebody close to you has just died. You've sent for Jesus, he shows up, but you don't know what's going to happen. Every time we read this, we already know the outcome. But we cannot fully understand it until we realize they didn't. Uh, Jesus had just left where they were at. And just imagine this in your mind. It's Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And they're all going about their lives. And one day Lazarus is out working and Mary's doing housework like she always does. And Mary's doing her thing. I mean, Martha was doing housework. And uh, Lazarus comes in, maybe for lunch, and he says, you know, I'm not feeling very well today. And the next day he comes in and he says, I'm, I'm still not feeling good. I think I'm going to lay down. And in a few days, he's bedridden. Well, at this point, Mary and Martha are taking care of him. They're bringing him water, bringing him food. He's not getting any better. They are taking care of him as he moves closer to death. We understand that. The man is sick, getting worse, 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 and worse, and then he dies. And we read it. We know that he's going to raise up again, but they didn't know that. Okay, or, or maybe he got cut and got an infection. Maybe something happened. You know, me and Angie used to have a, a young lady in her life, and, and she got a toothache one day. And before long, that tooth got infected, and the infection went to her brain and killed her. She was in her 20s. And it was just that fast. Something like that happened to Lazarus. Something happened in his body that took the life from him. Now, we know the ending, but they don't. We do know that it was bad enough that Mary and Martha sent a runner. Look at verse 3. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. They sent a runner to Jesus saying, get here fast. We know that you can do something in this situation. And we are nursing him back to, as well as we can. We're doing what we can. But we need you here now. We need you. Now sometimes in my life I felt like I needed to send a runner. Go get Jesus. Get me some help. Get him here. I need some help. But Jesus came too late, didn't he? Now, it would, it would seem, and it even says, that he tarried where he was at for two days. I could look it up here. I'm pretty sure that's what it says. But I want you to think back in your life. Have you, and raise your hand, have you ever been in the room with somebody when they died? That's not a lot of fun, is it? Under the best of circumstances, when this person is born again, when they have a testimony, when you know where they're going to go, it's awful. Now, if they're born again, they leave you something to where you can say, I know that they're better off now than they were before. And when they're not born again, you can't say that. And that, that makes it, takes it to a whole other level. But when you are there with them and they die, all dignity leaves. That is where Mary and Martha are. At this point. Now think back to that time in your life and realize that that is where these women are. And when Jesus finally gets there, they've been through all this. They've been through the sickness. They've been through the death and the burial at this point. And all the caring for him while he was sick. Now, although Jesus says in verse 4, when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. I'll bet you that Mary and Martha don't feel like it's too glorious at this point. Don't you? Mm -hmm. 
It's a terrible time in these two women's lives. So we know it's been four days, and he's, he's dead and he's buried, and finally Jesus shows up at the home of Lazarus. Now, let's look at the exchange between exhausted, heartbroken Martha's reaction when Jesus shows up. Look at verse number 20. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went out to meet him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. And Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the, the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Now, Martha makes a legitimate statement there. Look at verse number 22, the one I told you to underline. But I know that even now, that's not the verse I want you to read. Verse 21, Then saith Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not have died. What she's saying is, if she looks him straight in the eyes and said, Jesus, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. All you had to do is be here in my time of need. When I needed you here, I sent the runner for you, but you tarried. I needed you here at this time in my life. He wouldn't have died. Now, James talked about this morning, we have access to it. What if he was sitting here in, in fleshly form? We have full access anytime we need to talk to Jesus. But they didn't. And she looks him straight in the face and said, I needed you at this time because Lazarus died. Or because you weren't here, Lazarus died. Now, think about that. That's a pretty serious statement. In other words, what she does, she brings up the, the thing of the past. If you had been here, that's past tense, this wouldn't have happened to us. I wouldn't have had to go through this. If you had been here, my heart wouldn't be broken. If you had been here, Lazarus would be alive and with us right now. Because you weren't here, Lazarus died. Past tense, because you were not here. What's she saying? You weren't here for me. I needed you at this time. Now, it's okay to remember the past. I think it even says it right down there. Do this in remembrance of me. It, at times, we're commanded to remember the things that Jesus done. But at this particular time, what she's remembering is, you weren't here for me. Now, what she's doing is not wrong, but it's also not complete. And I'm going to show you what I'm talking about here in just a minute. Now, as we sit here, I want you to think about your past. What is the thing that makes you say, God, this happened in my life. If you had been in my life at this time, it wouldn't happen to me. Bad things happen to us sometimes, don't they? If you look back and search deep into your past, you're going to say, this happened to me. It changed the trajectory of my life. Where were you at when this happened? If you loved me, this wouldn't, you wouldn't have let this happen to me. You were not here when I needed you the most. Now I want you to understand something. He's here with us all the time. But what our mind and what our flesh wants to do is say, you let me down. And that's exactly what she's saying here. Had you been here, my brother wouldn't have died. How can you love me? How can... You care, say that you care about me and let this happen to me. Or in this particular situation, it was her family. 
Now, you might hurt me, but my fa- you let my family down. Where were you at when this was happening to my family, Jesus? Now, that's a serious statement to make to Christ. And we miss this always because we know the end of the story. We know it always turns out all right. But this is where Martha's at. You love me, but you let me down. But then she says something strange in verse 22. Let's look at it. But I know that even now, whatsoever that will ask of God, God will give it to you. And what she's saying is, I know that whatever you ask will happen. So the first statement about the past she made. And then she almost seems to say something that make that she thinks will make Jesus say, but I've got, she's got faith in you. You know, you, I, you love me, but you let me down, but I do have faith in you. It's kind of like a, a bumper sticker or something we see on a car, you know, the bread of life never goes stale or something like that, that we see that that has no real meaning to it. It means nothing if you just put the bumper sticker on your car and it has no life experience behind it. Do you know what I mean? I love, you, you love me, Jesus, but you let me down. But I know that whatever you ask that God will do. But you did let me down. That's what she's saying, right? I heard Mary been talking. They said the same thing. They said the exact same thing. Word for word, exactly the same thing. I don't think she did yet. But I got a feeling she's getting ready to here very shortly. Okay, verse 23. And then Jesus saith unto her, Your brother will rise again. Now, she brought up the past. I love you, but you let me down. I needed you, but you let me down. But, you know, whatever you ask of God... I know he's going to give it to you. So she had to kind of make up for what she had said. But then Jesus says something to her that's in present tense. That means it's going to happen. It's going to happen right now. And what he says is, your brother will rise again. That means right now, in the moment we're living in. It's not going to happen in the future. It's going to be in the very near future. But... In the, this very day, something is going to happen. Your brother is going to rise again. Now look at her response to that. And Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she's went from looking at the past. If you'd have been here, it wouldn't have happened. You say you love me, but you let me down. Jesus says, today I'm going to do something. And then all of a sudden, she says, yeah, Thousands of years from now, I know it's all going to work out all right. That's not when Jesus said he's going to do it. He says, your brother shall rise again. That means I'm here. I'm going to work in the situation. And she says, yeah, a couple thousand years from now. Now, raise your hand if you've ever done that. Jesus promises you something. And you say, yeah, it's all going to work out when we get to heaven. We've all done that. But he wants to work in your situation right here this morning. Amen. He is here for your problem. He is here for whatever it is that you look back in your past and say, Amen. if you'd have been here, it wouldn't happen to me. If you'd have loved me, you wouldn't have let me down. Good. When you look back and say that, he's right here saying, something's going to happen today. But what's the key? you got to believe. Amen. Good. Where are we at on time here? exactly right and Martha we know that she was a problem solver don't we oh I'm getting ahead of myself again 
Okay, so Martha then responds, yeah, 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 in the resurrection, a few thousand years from now, everything's going to be all right. That's exactly what she says. Your brother will rise again, and Martha saith unto him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Thousands of years from now. She's confident that's going to happen in thousands of, thousands of years from that very day. But then Jesus makes his I am statement. Look right there at verse number 25. And Jesus saith unto her, listen to what she said first. I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection. I am the life. You look at me for the resurrection. He makes his I am statement. I am the resurrection and the life. Now what's he saying? In every other statement, I want you to see this. He spoke to people. He spoke to multitudes. Think about the feeding of the 5,000. The 5,000 followed him where he was at. They were still there. He said, I am the bread of life. They, the, I am the light. He healed the blind man. And there were so many people crowded around that he had to sneak away and go find the blind man and say, I am Christ. He talked to multitudes and he said, I am. But in this particular situation, he was standing feet from her and he looked her in the eye and said, I am the resurrection and the life. This is a one-on-one -on -one thing. And it's a one-on-one -on -one thing with you in your life. He's saying, I am the resurrection. And in this situation, in your life, whatever it is, I am the resurrection. I am what can put life back in that situation. It's me. Don't look to the future. In this fifth statement, he made it to one woman, Martha. And he wants to make it to you. So now somebody tell me, I already asked you the question, then I have to tell you that. What is he trying to show Martha? Somebody explain that to me. Good. Now listen. He is trying to show her that whatever happened in the past is just that. It's in the past. And he's saying, I am here right now. I am here to handle the situation right now. I am here to resurrect our relationship. Now see, the relationship is what was damaged. When she looked at Jesus and said, if you love me, you wouldn't have let this happen to me. If you had have been here, he wouldn't have died. You wasn't here, you let me down. Okay, the relationship between Martha and Jesus is what was damaged there. And Jesus came back and he said, I'm going to move in this situation. Let the past go. Our relationship is what's important here. I am here to rebuild the confidence that you've lost in me. You see, Jesus knew what was going to happen when he was wherever he was when they sent the runner for him. He knew exactly the thoughts that Martha was having. And of course, he said, I'm going to go that uh, God might be glorified. And this is how he done it. The, the fact that Lazarus got raised up was just a side effect of what he wanted to do between him and Martha. He wanted to rebuild that relationship. So the confidence that she lost in him, he was there to say, I'm here to fix it. And I'm going to show you my glory. Now we understand that, right? This is one-on-one -on -one between, between Martha and Jesus. Lazarus hadn't even came into the picture yet, other than the fact that they sent the runner to go get him. But he's saying, I'm here now. I'm here to resurrect our relationship. I'm here to give Zoe life because I am the resurrection and the life. I want you to live a full, happy life, Martha. Now, he's going to speak life into Lazarus. And that's bio's life. Life that means that he rises up, he starts breathing, blood starts coursing through his body again. Two different kinds of life here. The kind he wants to give Martha and the kind he wants to give Lazarus. Now he's saying, I don't want you to just go through the motions. Stick the bumper sticker on your car, do whatever you want to do. Go through the motions, but I want this relationship between me and you to work. I want our relationship to be good. I am here now for you. That's what he's saying. 
Now in your life, whatever happened, the thing that you thought of when I told you to look back through your life, he's here this morning and he's letting you know that he's here to resurrect that relationship, to bring life back into the relationship, the confidence that you might have lost in him. He wants to move in the situation. So Martha said, had you been here in past tense, my brother would not have died. Jesus responds, your brother will rise. That's present tense, meaning right now. Martha's reply in verse 24 was, he will rise in the resurrection, future tense. And Jesus is trying to get Martha to see the past is gone. The future has not happened, but I'm here right now in front of you, willing to work in your life. Now look at verse 25. Jesus saith to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Now what's he saying? He's saying, I am the solution. Right now, not in the future. I am the solution to a broken past. I am a, the solution to these cliches. You know, I, the bread of life never goes stale. The thing that she said if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now whatsoever you ask of God, he will give you. She had to kind of repair that. But he don't want to hear that. He's saying, I am here to move in your situation. Right now. Amen. And a future hope that's thousands of years away is thousands of years away. I'm here to fix it right now. But then he goes on to say, He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Now what's the key to it all? I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me. You have to believe that he can do it. How do we increase our belief in Christ? How do we increase our faith? How do we do that? We read his word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In order to increase your faith that he can move in the situation you need him to move it in, you have to read his word concerning that situation. You have to speak life out of the Bible into the situation that you're working in. You have to know what it says. He is the solution. He wants to give you life. He wants to give you Zoe life. Happy, full, enjoyable life. That's his desire. And that's here on earth. It all hinges on your belief. On your faith. And you have to build that up. Now, when Jesus invites us to follow him, He's inviting us to follow him into a life that can only be experienced by his followers. Now, we, the, the word of God even says that there is pleasure in sin for a season, right? But there is pleasure in a life, a Christian life, forever. Amen. What time we're still here on earth and what time when we go to heaven for eternity. There is pleasure in that life. And we have to choose which one we want. Yes. Now, just like I, when Jeremy was talking, we, we see that Martha was a problem solver, and we're not going to look back there. We don't have enough time. But in Luke 10, 38, if you want to write it down, everybody was hungry, and Martha was cooking, right? She saw the need. She was going to fulfill the need. She was a problem solver. But people like that, and I'm somewhat that way myself, when something comes along that we can't solve, it puts us in a state of panic. And that's where she's at right now. She nursed him. She fed him. She gave him water. She cleaned him. She done all the things that a good sister would do for a brother, but the problem still stayed. She had to start depending on Jesus to solve the problem. Now, she likes to solve the problems. I do too. But when Jesus looked her in the eye and said, all you have to do is believe, she, she wanted to do that, but she didn't. And how do I know that? Look right over there across the page. At verse 
38. Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was a cave and the stone lay upon it. And Jesus said take away the stone. And look what Martha says right there. Martha the sister of him that was dead saith unto him. Lord by this time he stinketh. Now is she focused on what he told her he was going to do? She's focused on the fact that he is dead. That he stinks in the cave. But a gracious Christ was there. And if that had been me, I would have said, you do not get it. I'm going back to where I came from. You don't get it, Martha. But look what happens. Jesus said, take the stone away. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he's been dead four days. And Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee, that if you would believe, thou should see the glory of God. Then they took the stone away from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe on thou, that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot, with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. And Jesus saith unto them, Loose him, and let him go. And then the Jews that were around there believed. But a gracious Christ done what he said he was going to do anyway. He said, Your brother will rise. You have to believe. And two times after that, she made it plain that she didn't believe. But he done it anyway. He held his end of the bargain up. And that's what he wants to do for us this morning. Amen. The key to it all is we have to believe. Eric, you pray for it. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you for Kevin, Lord, anointing and using him. God, I pray you just uh, take everything you've got for us out of this lesson. Put our trust in you and know you've got everything in control. Have you ready the rest of the service, the rest of the day, in Jesus' name.